It's on. It's on. Good evening, everybody. And uh, uh, today we, uh, we have Dr. Manu Plat visiting us from Georgia Tech. Uh, I've known Manu since uh, he started his PhD uh, at Georgia Tech Emory Biomedical Engineering in 2001. I was a postdoc at the University of Georgia at the time. And I still recall our first meeting at, uh, I think it was at Hilton Head. Yeah. Uh, he still has the same laugh, a very hearty laugh, and so it's, so the kid in him, in him is still there. Uh, but Manu has done wonderful things since then, so he, he uh, after finishing his PhD at, uh, at Georgia Tech Emory, he spent some time at MIT doing a postdoctoral fellowship there, and then Georgia Tech uh, hired him back to, uh, to serve on their faculty. So he's been there since uh, then. And he's done a lot of exciting things there in the context of uh, scholarship. He's a recipient of the NIH Director's New Innovation Award. Uh, he's, he's received funding from the International AIDS Society, the Georgia Cancer Coalition, and the National Science Foundation. But more importantly, uh, uh, Dr. Platt is a, is a fantastic role model, and he's done, some, he's done some really great things with the community in the Atlanta area. And uh, I had the... Uh, opportunity to listen to his lecture last year at the BMES Society meeting where he received the BMES Diversity Award. And, and one thing I can really tell you is that the lecture when I heard it, um, it was so honest but more importantly it was very hard hitting. And it really presented uh, a picture of where we are in the, in the country right now, uh, especially in the context of uh, a lot of work that we need to do uh, in diversity and inclusion. So I am confident that uh, Dr. Platt's lecture today is still going to be hard hitting, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the talk. And uh, Dr. Platt, once again, welcome to the University of Arkansas. Thank you, much. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. Let's see if we can get this out. There we go. That's me. Um, no, it's, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. It's actually, I've been telling people all day, I actually used to live in Arkansas. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force. I was living in Arkansas from first through third grade um, when Bill and Hillary were in the governor's mansion. And Chelsea's my age. And actually, um, at the end of the summer after my first grade, I was in a summer program for first graders at University of Arkansas Little Rock. And Bill Clinton actually gave a speech at the end, and then all of us got to go line up and shake his hand as we walked down. <laughs> um, so it's good to be back in Arkansas. Um, but um, it's always it's great to talk about these topics, as, as particularly mentioned today. And I was really excited that it was so well received at the Biomedical Engineering Society um, annual conference. Um, so hopefully it'll be received well here. But I do bring you greetings from Georgia Tech and Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And the title of this is The Danger of Acting Now. Um, because there are lots of things where people say you should wait before you do something, and there's a risk if you actually take action now, but that danger can actually pay off. So I'll, over the course of this time with you, I will start off with a few different perspectives. So I'll talk about now, the state of things presently, and it's important to mention this is according to my lived experience. So everyone has their own lived experience. I can only talk about mine. I'm not saying anything about the way you experience the world is telling you how I have experienced it, okay? And then uh, the second part will be about now, and this will be the message to the students and early career professionals. Like, I should do something now, but maybe I should wait. I should wait till it's safe. Um, and then we'll end with now and practical tips to make change, okay? <clears throat> so, now. Um, it's interesting, when I started the Biomedical Engineering Society Diversity Award Lecture, um, the first thing I asked was, you know, why do people think I'm up here? And Probably a lot of people think, oh, he's only up there because he's black. <laughs> That's fine. I know I'm black, okay? <laughs> Some people like to say African American. Um, that's a few too many syllables for me. Black. Cut to the chase. I know I'm black. My mom's black. My dad's black. My brothers are black. My grandmother's black. My grandfather's black. My cousins are black. I'm black, okay? Um, we have people that are addicted to drugs in my family. I have people that have been incarcerated in my family. I have people that are HIV positive in my family. I have people with bad credit in my family. But at the same time, I have teachers in my family, lots of teachers, veterans, uh, psychological counselors, professors, union workers, 
All those things are in my black family. We are all of those things. And so then things like this happen. And it's interesting being a professor where we know that in STEM fields, only about 2% of professors are African American, just to be nice. 2% are black, right? And I like to tell people that I'm black because people want to say or think, approach me as though, oh, you're not black. You're not like the other blacks. I'm black. I leave this building. I will walk across the campus, black. And people who see me will know that I'm black. I'll sit into a room without opening my mouth, and they will know that I'm black. I'm no different than other black people, and my family's not different either. So when I see something like this happen, my family and friends, we re-applaud. We know what's going on. And I want to remind the audience of what was actually happening. He's not protesting the flag. He's not protesting the military. The statistic is very clear. Unarmed black people were killed by police at five times the rate of unarmed whites in 2015. He's black on the football field, and he's black when he walks off the football field. And he has to live in America with these kinds of statistics. But let's make this more personal. These are unarmed black children, men and women, killed by police. Now, the first two were not. Trayvon was killed when someone who wanted to be a policeman. Um, and Jordan Davis was not killed by a policeman. But the others were. And they were unarmed. Police killed at least 104 unarmed black people in 2015. That's nearly twice, two people each week. I walk around black. I walk around in this black body. And when I walk across in America, I have to worry about this as well, despite my degrees, despite my wonderful position as a professor. Nobody knows all that. I'm just black. But I want to show this. Um, some people maybe don't, maybe aren't, um, maybe this doesn't impact people. But what if it were to say unarmed black sons, daughters, fathers, and cousins killed by police? Because these people can look like people that are in my family, and this is what I see. Or this doesn't affect people. What about unarmed Americans killed by police? That's to be the grand unifier. All of us are Americans. If you didn't know what color they were, and this is the number of Americans killed by police, does that have an impact? And I put these numbers on the screen because these are the ages at which their lives were ended. And the one that was really devastating to me was Tamir Rice, who was 12 in Cleveland, killed by police within two seconds of them showing up on the scene as he played outside with a toy gun. Because my youngest brother was actually 12 at the time that this happened. And it really hit hard of now we have to be worried about him in different ways. Right? But then the really tough statistic is these are the numbers whose killers were convicted. Only Jordan Davis. And Michael Dunn was only convicted of killing Jordan Davis during the second trial. The first trial, he was, it was a hung jury for the murder of Jordan Davis. They convicted um, him for manslaughter or attempted manslaughter of his two friends that were in the car that he shot at and missed. But for killing Jordan Davis, hung jury. So they had to do another trial, and he was convicted. Only 13 of the 104 cases in 2015 where an unarmed black person was killed by police resulted in officers even being charged with the crime. Forget about convicted, even being charged. And again, Alton Sterling, his, um, I'm sorry, the last time one of the his um, cops again were let go. He was one, they did bring charges. Or I'm sorry, they announced, not last week, this is now months ago. No charges against officers in Alton Sterling's death. This was the gentleman in Baton Rouge who was, getting, was at the gas station shot terribly. All of this was caught on video, by the way. And then, and this happened a while ago. The Charleston Nine, where they were in church praying, and a man came in and killed these nine souls. The cops bought, I'm not going to say his name, they bought the murderer Burger King after his calm arrest. So they're killing unarmed black people. They know that he killed nine people in this church. He's apprehended safely, and he gets Burger King. Uh, we're all still reeling from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting from February. Cops later apprehended him without incident. We all know how many people he killed in that school. They know he has a gun, without incident. Stefan Clark, this happened in the Bay Area early this year as well, 22 years old, gunned down by a policeman, unarmed, in his grandmother's backyard. The cops thought he had a gun. He had a cell phone. And this one just happened. And this one is freaking us out all over again for black men walking around. Both them Shem John in Dallas, Texas, 26 years old, shot by a police officer 
in his own home, resting. He's at home. The cop who shot him said she mistakenly thought he was in her apartment. He's at his own apartment. This is her excuse. Oh, I thought he was in my apartment and he didn't listen when I told him to put his hands up or whatever she said. So we can't even sit at home as black men and not be shot by police. James Baldwin said, to be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage for these and many other reasons. James Baldwin was a legendary black gay um, author. He was quite an activist. And he talks about being in a constant state of rage, but in this picture, he's smiling. So how is he talking about being in a constant state of rage and he's smiling? Well, I'm smiling in this picture. Smiling in this picture, smiling in this picture, smiling in this one, and this one, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And then here's where the smiling stops. But we're smiling all the time, right? Because I do want to enjoy and live a good life while I'm here, right? As we all do. And then I take you back to Colin Kaepernick, which is amazing that this just happened. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And that's when we talk about this danger of acting now. By him acting, he hasn't been playing in the NFL for at least two years, right? Two years, just because he said, I wish police would stop killing unarmed black people. Bayard Rustin worked with Dr. Martin Luther King, a um, black gay civil rights activist who, who actually was one of the people that helped Dr. King understand the principle of nonviolence. And one of his quotes, when an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge his dignity as a human being, his very act of protest confers dignity on him. And this is why people support Colin Kaepernick, because just his act of protest is a dignified act, even though people um, pretend they would not like to understand it. But let's look at this again. When an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge her dignity as a human being, this is the new conversation, how this big, beastly, uh, prima donna woman who's super strong and mean has messed it up for this poor, delicate young thing. They're actually close to the same size. He's not that much bigger than her. But that's the message that is portrayed by this black woman who was sticking up for herself. And what's the fallout? Well, now the umpires are going to boycott her. Because how dare she stand up for herself when she feels disrespected and she's at the top of her field? They're going to boycott. My God. <laughs> And this piece came out last night, and again, I'm a black man, and I don't pretend to understand what, uh, what black women deal with in America. I can sympathize, but again, I can talk from my experience, and I will trust them on theirs. This is a piece that I do encourage you to check out. It's by Brittany Packnett. Um, she, it's an Elle magazine published online last night, You Owe Me an Apology, which is, of course, what Serena commanded of the umpire. And I want to read this to you, but the idea that someone would need to affirm responsibility for their actions and impact on me had just never occurred to me. So Brittany, when she heard that Serena said, you owe me an apology, she's shocked that she has never asked someone for an apology herself. I have quietly carried the scars of apologies desired but never received, seething with resentment but never questioning why I didn't demand an apology in the first place. I've always known, as black mothers say, that closed mouths don't get fed. And I've heard that several times from my parents, okay? And that it is rare that anyone receives that which they do not ask for. Still, I had not formed my lips to utter the words, you owe me an apology, which is what Serena said after she felt that she was being disrespected. And again, this perspective from this black woman, I am a black woman in America. I have been owed plenty of apologies. I just never believed I deserved to demand one. And this is where Serena is now moving the needle, because now people are starting to appreciate this fact that I should ask for an apology when someone completely disrespects me. So I'd like to show this picture because, again, when I, I talk a lot about black men and the fear that things that happen with black men, but that's because I'm one of six um, brothers. I'm the second oldest of six. This is my older brother. This is young Awadi. He's now 16. Again, he was the one who was 12 when Tamir was uh, killed. And this picture actually looks quite happy because we don't all get together so often. But actually, this was a terrible event because it was actually the funeral of one of my 26-year-old uh, cousins who had been killed violently in North Carolina. And why this was especially rough is this was the second one that year. Um, earlier that year, one of my cousins was shot um, dead in Trenton, New Jersey, while going into a convenience store on the way to pick up his daughter from his baby mom's house. And he was 28. Um, and just last year, while I was at the Evercams conference in Phoenix, got a call from my aunt, my 31-year-old cousin, 
shot with a shotgun in the middle of the street in Allentown, Pennsylvania. A guy hit him in his car, he got out to approach him, and they shot him. Messed up my Africans conference. I'm black in America, so when people say things happen to black people, they happen to me and to other people that you know. But here we are, we are a very happy group. <laughs> we try to be. Um, I was born in Trenton, New Jersey, and then again, as I mentioned, I moved to North Little Rock, Arkansas from first through third grade. Um, and then I spent third through fifth grade in Altus, Oklahoma, down here in the corner. And then my dad um, retired in Dover, Delaware from the Air Force. He did 20 years in the Air Force. Um, and he finished by the time he was 38, 20 years in the Air Force, finished his first career. I'm 39 right now. When he was 38, he had five kids. No college degree, and was retiring from a steady job. Wow. <laughs> I'm 39, and it's interesting, this is the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's death, who also was gunned down at 39. So this has been a really impactful year. And I bring that up because, for those that don't know, little black boys are not really supposed to be smart, or not supposed to be nerds, right? And so if you read too much or you do too well in school, that's called being white or acting white. And growing up, I was called that, even by my brothers, and they are all really, really smart, right? But they were still like, ooh, Mana, you fight, because my grades were better than theirs. But they, they got too many Bs. They got a couple Bs, um, which is a hard way to be. Like, I love school. School was my jam, so I wasn't going to turn that off, right? Um, so that's why when I, when I went to Morehouse College, everything changed, because Morehouse College is a historically black college. It's all male in Atlanta, Georgia. And there, to be at Morehouse, it wasn't about worrying what it was like, what, or I didn't have to be chronically aware that I was a black man, right? Because everyone there was a black man. So I got to explore all of the other parts of myself because I didn't have to always be like, let me work, uh, be concerned about how people are looking at me as a black man and help make other people feel comfortable. And because of that, I also found that there's all different types of black men, all different types, not just the messages that we see on the media and in the news. So you have wealthy ones, you have poor ones, you have rich ones, I'm talking really rich, those that like rock and roll music, those that skateboard, those that like hip hop, those that make beats, those that love science, those that love art history, those that are gay, those that are trans, they're all kinds of black men. And this is what I got to experience when I was at Morehouse College. And it really was a formative time for me to get to find the other parts of my personality without this concern about let me look like how black men are supposed to be. So when I think about black men, I think black men look like this. I think black men look like this. That's actually me freshman year. <laughs> I think black men look like this. 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 And of course, black men look like this. So they look all of these types of things. I'd like to point out, this is me pre-freshman summer program. Now, for those that don't know, I'm not in the picture because we didn't do selfies in 1997. And I actually had to use this bulky contraption called a Camera, <laughs> and with that, I was taking the picture, and then you had to take that whole camera with this chemically treated piece of paper inside that captured the essence of your soul, and you would take it to the drugstore, and they would give you a piece of paper to remind you of the image you captured however long ago. So I'm not in this picture. This is every picture that I then um, inserted myself through Photoshop. <laughs> Because then I caught up to technology. Um, but this is all 97. These are these knuckleheads. And these end up becoming the great friends of my time. And I'm actually going to see them all tomorrow in New Orleans. Um, but out of those four that started at Morehouse in that summer program, these people attended other schools. But the four of us attended Morehouse. This is us at Morehouse Homecoming 2016. Actually, this is, yeah, this is like 2017. But between the four of us, there are four master's degrees. And I don't have a master's degree, right? So my buddy Frank has two master's degrees, one in psychology and one in education and two doctorates. Of course, my PhD is in biomedical engineering, and Frank got his PhD in psychometrics. These other gentlemen were in the summer program as well. The Wayne is the one that's getting married um, coming up in a month. Um, and he worked for the Congressional Budget Office, got a master's in public policy, at the same, and the, in his off time worked on a blog that he sold to theroot.com. So he quit his government job last year. Uh, VerySmartBrothers.com, check it out. And we're so proud of him. He so he did his government job, and now he's um, a writer and a public speaker. Um, Jamal Wilson got his PhD in mechanical engineering. He was working for Maytag. Now he's back in Atlanta. Uh, Will Humphreys is a, let me make sure I do this right, is a pediatric microneurosurgeon at Baylor. Um, and Calvin is um, a medical doctor at uh, Meharry. And my good buddy Adrian was a program manager. He had his master's in economics. And now he runs his own business in DC getting government contracts. This is what I think about when I see black men. 
because I know these people, I know this is real. So a little bit about my path. So I graduated, or I uh, left Dover, Delaware, came down to Morehouse College. This is the chair of the biology department, Dr. J.K. Haynes, who when I was graduating, I knew I wanted to do biomedical engineering. And he sent me over to Bob Neerum, who's one of the fathers of, of tissue engineering, um, who was at Georgia Tech. And I went to meet with him to talk about Georgia Tech's programs. And I was a total geek, total nerd, and I looked up what Georgia Tech was doing online, and it was what I call science nonfiction, right? Things that, who knew things, things were happening in labs. So after that conversation, he called me a week later and was like, hey, would you like to work in my lab? And I would do anything for a research project, right? Because Moore has a small liberal arts school. So I started working with him my senior year, and he gave me a paycheck at the end of the month. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> so awesome. Awesome. So take every opportunity, because you never know what will happen. And then I graduated from Morehouse in 2001, and I started the Georgia Tech Emory Joint Biomedical Engineering Program. Second class in the country that just started. Um, and it's, as I say, it's still the best class that has ever come out of that program, um, even though I'm back. And I work with Han Jung Jo on cardiovascular disease and biomechanics and how fluid shift stress influences cardiovascular disease. And this was my very first undergrad, Randy Ankeny, who was from Nebraska. He went to the University of Nebraska, but was from South Dakota. And so I was really nervous about working with him. I was like, what? How are we going to get along? Right? But again, you recognize people as people, and we are still really good friends to this day. And he ended up coming to Georgia Tech and getting his PhD as well. And so then, like most people, so again, I had to make a decision about going to work for NASA, had several NASA scholarships and NASA fellowship, um, or stay in the academy. And so I made the decision to stay in the academy and do a postdoc. And as Raj mentioned in the intro, I went up to MIT and worked with Doug Laufenberger and Linda Griffith for about two and a half years, and here I am today. But I had several mentors along the way, some that look like me and some that don't, right? And what I always say is, uh, consider, I'll take advice from anyone, but consider the source, because everyone has a lens with which they are providing that advice. And sometimes it's good for you and sometimes it's not, but you should hear the options, because if there's something you don't know, you never know what you'll learn. So January 2009, I came back to Atlanta and started uh, the Platt Lab for Repair, Regeneration, and Remodeling. Check us out, platlab.com. Um, these are our major research areas. And as you notice, most of the research questions we ask are health disparities and things that affect my community. And I find that important. Those are questions that drive me, that are interesting to me, and they also have wide gaps of spaces that need to be filled. And so then when you start your lab, everyone tells you, wait to do all these things. If I'm on this tenure track, Everybody's like, wait to do all of these things, right? But when I started my professor job in January 1st, 2009, Barack Obama, 19 days later, would become the first black president of the United States. And it's just interesting as I would chart me starting this new, this new endeavor that I thought was major and important with him starting as well, right? And he gives us this quote, of course, Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for, and we are the changes that we seek. And here I am starting this new professor job with all this open opportunity and things that I could do to use this platform. And he's like, hey, everybody go out there and make a difference. What about me? So this is when you get to the point where as a young person you ask yourself, now? Your mentors may be telling you, wait to do that until a few years from now. Wait until after you propose before you start getting involved doing all this outreach. Wait until this because of this, this, and that. And again, I'll take, listen to advice from anyone, but consider the source, all right? And I love this quote by RuPaul. What other people think about me is none of my business, all right? Mana, you shouldn't be going to those elementary schools and doing this stuff. You need to focus on your research. That's your business. You should keep that to yourself. Thank you, right? I love this quote. Now, I would love to live by this in all aspects of life, <laughs> but peer review. <laughs> in the field that we have chosen, how do we be successful? We send work out and our peers review us. So we kind of have to think about what other people think about us. And peer review is not a golden, gilded road that gets you to where you're going. It's abusive because all of us were nerds and beat up on the playground and feel like we can take it out on this <laughs> author behind this uh, anonymous screen. You gotta be tough. And again, wait until you get tenure. It does nobody any good if you don't get tenure here because you're doing these other activities. So let's talk about tenure, okay? Soon after I got started, uh, this article came out in Science Magazine about NIH funding. 
And <laughs> it was a silence. Sorry, I have to laugh when I think back on this. And it said, all things normalized. Like, that means institution where you got your PhDs, publication record, previous backgrounds, all of those things normalized. Black PIs are still 50% less likely to be funded. Well, that's fun. <laughs> I need these NIH grants to get tenure. But you want me to wait until I get tenure to do these other things that I can use that are important with this platform. Well, I'm not in this job thinking I'm good. I mean, I'm going to work to get tenure, but I don't expect tenure to just come because I believe in Murphy's Law. Now, there's two things. So, you know, Murphy's Law, if anything can go wrong, it will. But at the same time, you can't block your blessing. That's what my mother always told me. So I believe that I'm blessed, but I ain't that special. OK, that's how I put it together. Um, so this was interesting. And so my mentors are like, wait until you do all this stuff and get tenure. Well, the thing that also has to be realized is I'm not going to get tenure like a 50 plus Korean immigrant, which is my PI. I'm not going to get tenure the same way he will. I'm not going to get tenure the same way Bob Neerum got tenure 80, I mean, he's 80 years old now, but when he got tenure 55 years ago as a, as a white man. That's not my path to tenure, right? So there's different paths for all of us that we need to decide. And for me, what if, if I have all of this, I still don't get tenure, right? If I wait until all of these times and I still don't get tenure, how will I feel knowing that I've wasted that five years of using this platform to do some good? Well, for me, that doesn't sit well. And so I was like, let's go, let's run, let's do the things that we want to do. And so I began to study sickle cell disease. I switched to it um, because sickle cell has some really interesting problems. Um, and what about in America? It is a health disparity, predominantly affects African Americans in the United States. One in 400 has sickle cell disease, one in 12 has sickle trait, meaning if they are reproduced with a partner that has sickle trait, 25% chance their child will have sickle cell disease. But it's important for people to know it's not cured. Life expectancy is 36 for men, 42 for women. And that's in the United States, because globally, 300,000 babies are born each year with sickle cell disease and up to 90% of these children will die in the first five years of life. This is a devastating statistic. And this is something that will keep me up in the lab at night trying to help solve these problems. But where, and this is why I'm sharing these statistics with you is because I also have learned the importance as a minority in STEM, as a professor, of being a scientist activist. Because me studying this, I can tell the whole community and be the translator to help them understand why these things are problems. So think globally. Act locally. This was something that I used to basically play on TV when I was growing up. But I'd like to stress this, then act globally. And this is important because global health concerns are health disparities for underrepresented minorities in the United States. So as I mentioned, sickle cell disease is a health disparity in the US, but it is a global health problem that has a much broader impact if we can help solve it here in the wealthiest country in America or in the world. And then I also think this, understand this importance of becoming a scientist activist when studying health disparities. I really learned this when I started doing the HIV work because in talking with those groups of people, the clinicians were the best advocates for their patients back in the, in the 80s when they were just dying. There was stigma. People were throwing them out of the homes. Hospitals didn't want them. And the clinicians and the researchers had to go out and fight for the rights of their patients. And these are these amazing stories. That was why we've come so far. And I take this on. Why? Also, when I got my PhD, my whole family is thinking I'm a medical doctor. I told them I'm not. But of course, they're coming to ask me about every little problem that they have at the doctor. Now, it's not for me to rebuff them and say, oh, get out of my face. No. They need someone to translate what that doctor has told them. And they're putting their trust in me. And at the same time, when they are not listening to the doctor, then I am supposed to get on them and explain why what that doctor is saying is true. Y'all are so proud of me for getting a PhD, but I found out things that doctors are telling you that you're not listening to, right? And so I think it's important that if you are from an underserved community or whether you're from a part of the country that you don't see science, we are the translators, particularly in these days where science is really being uh, besmirched uh, publicly. So we also do a lot with the Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia. This is a day at the Capitol where we actually go to the Capitol and lobby congressmen, our state uh, representatives. And they find it really important for me to come because of this gravitas of me being this professor at Georgia Tech, that they want me to come and say a few words and to speak with their representatives. And of course, I bring my graduate students. But what we actually really care about in sickle cell is that these young children are having strokes. And this is unbelievable. So my PhD work was about people having strokes in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. But 11% of children with sickle cell will have a stroke by the age of 20. It's crazy. And up to a third, this is a paralytic stroke. And up to a third will have what we call a silent stroke. That's when it's in a cognitive part of the brain. 
So it's a thinking part. So they're sitting there, this little black kid is in class, the teacher's calling him dumb, he's lazy because he's getting bad grades. Under the MRI, oh my goodness, he's having strokes and his brain's dying. Sickle cell 1910 was when the first patient was identified in Chicago. It's been around long before then. 108 years ago, there's one drug on the market. We know the genetic mutation. We know the molecular cause. We know all these things about it. One drug. I'll let you guess why. So bringing all those ideas from my past to study sickle cell got me, as Dr. Rao mentioned, the, new direct, the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, which is like bring your wildest crazy ideas to solve something. And this is my first big grant, which is one and a half million dollars to spend, which was awesome. Um, but it takes me back to this. If you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. So if I was working a regular path trying to fit in and take some routine routes of the questions and ask the next incremental step, that wouldn't have happened and I wouldn't have opened up this door for me to become a sickle cell researcher. Another thing that impacts my community is HIV. Uh, check this out. Where is this predominantly happening? Oh my goodness. I don't know where, I, I don't know where Fayetteville is, but <laughs> there's a deep dark red here, which I'm guessing is Little Rock. But where <laughs> HIV is blooming in the United States is in the South, where I live. But it's also a health disparity. It's a dangerous disproportion. These numbers are from 2011, but the numbers are similar. I need to update them now, but they are similar. Check this out. Number of new HIV infections. For white men who have sex with men, this is an absolute number for that year, 13,000, okay? Then you go to black men who have sex with men, 10,000. Now let's think about this. Black men, period, are 6% of the United States population. Black men who have sex with men, I can't give you that number. But still, the absolute number of new HIV infections is almost equivalent to white men who have sex with men. It's crazy. And then what's next? Black heterosexual women. 7,000, absolute numbers. They also are 6% of the U.S. population. This is a dangerous disproportion. And then you have Hispanic men who have sex with men right after, followed by black heterosexual men. So these are things that are affecting my community, and that's why this work um, impacts me. But as I mentioned, it's a global health problem. So this work took me to South Africa. That's me. I am nervous. That blood does have HIV in it. Uh, because when we do our blood-borne pathogens training, we're supposed to treat everything as though it might. This blood does. <laughs> Woo! Okay. But uh, anyway, I'm safe. Everything's fine. <laughs> Woo! Um, and so we went down to Johannesburg, South Africa to do this work. Part of the reason we went to Johannesburg is because I couldn't get people at Emory University to give me the blood samples for testing. So where can I go? Johannesburg, where I had met some collaborators who got the grant that I got. And so my group went over there. And it became this amazing adventure. Um, because you got to see what was they have. They have lion club rescue centers and other wild parks. But the, the problems change when they're in a low resource setting. And this began to open my mind to what are new solutions that you have to solve when we're not in the accoutrements and all the fancy stuff of our labs back home. Um, and so that also led us to Ethiopia. This is the emergency room at Black Lion Hospital in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And we completely stocked this lab. This is my former grad student, now Dr. Ivana Parker. She spent two months over there working on um, HIV samples from Ethiopia, and when I went to visit her, of course I have to go visit, um, um, and brought her more supplies because they actually were running out of gloves, and she's working on HIV, and they were out of gloves at the medical supply shop. But in that time, they told me about breast cancer problems that were happening in Ethiopia, and so this is what has kept us sustained there. Where in the U.S., the breast cancer survival rates are 80%, Ethiopia, they're below 40%. And actually, young women are showing up with breast cancer. By young women, I mean in their early 20s, showing up with stage 3 and stage 4 breast cancer. So though I was really upset when I was first at Ethiopia because they kept my bags at the airport for like four days because they didn't want me to let my empty tubes and packs of gloves in, I was like, I'm never coming back here. But on the fourth day when the doctor that we were working with took me back to the airport to try again, he's telling me about breast cancer. And I was like, all right. I guess we'll continue. Mm -hmm. And we just, I just went back there again. I just came back last Thursday um, to continue this work. Mm -hmm. Because the grad students there, they are eager to solve these problems. They're able to collect the samples, but they don't have the infrastructure or the hands-on lab equipment. And so we've been teaching them how to run the tests we've been doing. Um, and you can see that's the team. This is the medical, or not the medical. He's the head of the biochemistry department that we've been working with. And these are the two grad students that went with me. And that is one of the tissue samples. And then I like to show this picture. So that's the, where the global health work comes into play. Again, I'm just running. This is all started pre-tenure. 
Okay, I want to be really clear about that. Also, for your tenure, I started working, this is Bob Learham, who you'll remember from the earlier slide, um, and Ms. Lakita Servants, and we actually started this pro project called Project Engages, which was a high school research program. And here was the need that we were meeting to fill. Georgia Tech is right in midtown Atlanta. And that back in, this is like six years ago, there weren't many students from Atlanta public schools applying to Georgia Tech. We are a public university just like University of Arkansas. So these are stats from 2014, what the superintendent was telling us that for every 100 students in APS, 59 graduate on time in four years. Of those 59 graduates, 35 enroll in college. And then of those 35, only 17 remain in college the next year. This is where the workforce is being lost in the United States, right? And this is happening in cities across America. And so I love this quote from Viola Davis when she won Best Actress at the Emmys in 2015. The first black woman ever to win Best Actress for a Drama happened in 2015. That's a question mark. But her speech was really fantastic. And she said, the only thing that separates women of color from anyone else is opportunity. And that is what our Project Engages began to be, to give these young people opportunity. And so we started to um, take in students from Atlanta Public Schools, uh, teach them how to work in Georgia Tech research labs on cutting edge research. And the real kick is we were paying these students $10.15 an hour. Because we don't want students who, because they have to be 16, but at that point, because they're low socioeconomic status for these APS schools, like they all have free lunch for every student. Um, if you need to work a job, so we don't want students who like, oh, I can do this for free because we have enough money in my family. If they were going to be working a job to support their family, why not work this job? Make $10 an hour, and it also helps your resume. We also made arrangements with their, public, um, with their school system and the superintendent so they could get out of school early for half days so that we could continue during the academic year where they continue to work 12 to 16 hours a week during the academic year. So 40 hours in the summer, 12 to 16 hours during the academic year, Pay ten dollars and fifteen cents an hour. I was working at Hardee's in high school, <laughs> making four dollars and twenty-five cents. Um, and I tell them that when they start to act up, okay? <laughs> but this has been amazing, and it's been really amazing not just for students, but for their families. Many of them have been included as co-authors in publications, um, and of course, they've now gone on to amazing colleges for um, their undergraduate. And also, many of these students are first-generation high school graduates. High school graduates. And hopefully they will then go on to be first generation college graduates. So when we go to their high school graduations, I mean the families are going crazy. And when the principals told us that stat, we were, you know, quite, quite shocked. But again, great places they're going to and it's some amazing scholarships. And this year we actually have touched our 100 student in the program. But what's been more exciting is we also had our first college graduates from the first class of Engages. This is them when they started in the program. Um, and three of them came back for our end of summer celebration. Uh, Chris, Solomon, and Robert, who have now graduated with their college degree. Okay? We're hoping we get some to go into grad school, but that's coming soon. But it's not just us programmatic leaders. It's where the grad students and the postdocs, they play the most critical part of this program. And the mentors are what keep these students going every day. So people like you all are the ones mentoring these students daily. And of course, I do have to thank my professors and senior researchers who have, quote, taken a chance on allowing these students to work in their lab because there was skepticism at first. But then we had to do the preparatory work. We do a boot camp to get the kids started so they know some things. They cover all their lab safety training, and then they get plugged in. And now we're actually disseminating the scholarship. So because I am a professor, we have to publish works. So we're publishing scholarship articles on how we've kicked off these programs and what are best practices and limitations. Um, and there's another paper under revision. Sorry, with Aisha, sure she's great. So that's why one other message I like to always tell people is to reach back and pull someone else up because and then celebrate them being themselves. Because if people think they need to change to be a scientist or change to be a researcher, it's less appealing. They get to be who they are. Great news. That's why I keep my dreadlocks. I keep my earrings. I don't act like it's easier when I walk into a conference and people see this tall black man with dreadlocks and earrings coming towards them and then back away and get scared. I'll find you later. Um, <laughs> but it's me, right? And I have to be objective and aware of that. But, and again, but that means you should bring your whole self to work as well. I love when Tim could make that speech. So in my lab, I represent Morehouse, clearly, of course, but I like music, song, dance, and the rest, and so we have the Platte Lab Grammys every year, and we surprise the ladies with the theater choreography. They didn't know what was going on. Um, <laughs> but we don't just do things that I like. We celebrated Chinese New Year this year with hot pot celebration. Um, we went, my Korean student actually got us going to Korean karaoke, which now is like, I mean, I just love it. Um, 
<laughs> right? And so we do things from every person's culture or hobbies that are in the lab group. And that's where inclusivity is important. So be yourself no matter where you go. This is me on Beijing on the, the Great Wall um, with Ed Beauchemin, another professor in my department. And provide others with a new perspective. People kept taking pictures with us because they thought we were basketball players. Right? <laughs> but I like to correct them and say, no, no. We're scientists, right? To let them know scientists can look like this as well. So diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And transformation is being allowed to dance to your own beat, right? And this is where we want to be. And we do a lot of dancing in my lab group. And then tenure comes, right? It comes. By being yourself and doing all of these things, um, it comes. And I'm still a nurse, so the research was popping. OK. And I love this quote by Maya Angelou. Success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it. And I think that last part is really nice, the how you do it, OK? And I was honored to um, have been selected for Emerging Scholars by Diverse Issues in Higher Education. And when they sent me, I was, they stoned me for the cover, which was really cool. But then they labeled it this. And I never thought about anything like this. But I love the way they phrase this, professors of purpose. Because I'm just living and doing the things that I think are right to do. But I do like this, top, this title, actually, Professors of Purpose. So now, what can we all do? Let's see how this is going to work out. OK, anybody remember the movie Time to Kill? Yes, came out in 19, this is Matthew McConaughey's star-making turn, for those that don't know. Um, and so it starts Matthew McConaughey, Ashley Judd, and Samuel Jackson. It took place in Mississippi, where Samuel Jackson's daughter was, brutally kid was kidnapped and then brutally raped by six men. And then Samuel Jackson, she came home, and they destroyed her womb and all of this. And she survived. They threw her over the bridge and threw her ditch, but she survived. And Sam Jackson sees one of the men and kills them. And now he's on trial. This is based on a John Grisham novel. So I'm going to play this one clip for you. Oh, who's not going to play? That's it. All right, I'll tell you what he says. So he talks about, he describes her. And he's doing it ominously. Picture her body. She's bloody, beaten, womb destroyed. Can't you see her? Because he has everyone in the courtroom to close their eyes as he's describing what happened to this poor little, little girl. And he has a girl the same age. And then he goes at the very end. Now imagine she's white. And that's when the whole courtroom wakes up, shocked. Is this black girl happening to her? OK. White girl? And this is a trick that I like to use, and I like to think if I'm being fair, how am I being? Because everyone has their own biases. Everyone. And so Ted Conway used to be a program officer at NSF, and um, I'm the diversity director for this um, science and technology center. And he said, well, when I RU program, he said, you're great with minorities, and you're great with getting women, but it's the third leg that you're missing. I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, people with disabilities. And I was like, Ted, oh, I said, well, but like, what if they can't do the work? Well, like, what if they make, what if people with disabilities make other people in the lab uncomfortable? Like, do I need to, like, give them something easier to do because to make them feel safe? What if they can't even get here without help? What if, <laughs> and by the fifth what if, I just had to stop. Because I realized every question I was asking him were things people have said about black people or about women. And it just blew my mind. And I said, okay, never mind, Ted, we're going to find some. We're going to find some. And this is a trick that I like to do. I like to switch it out and see how it works for me. And so let's look at some of these instances that happened earlier this year. A black Yale student was napping, and a white student called the police. Let's flip that. A white Yale student was napping in her dorm, and a black student called the police on her. Does that sound right? Native American brothers were pulled from a campus tour after a nervous parent calls police. And these Native American brothers had traveled seven hours to tour Colorado State University. But let's turn this around. White brothers that had traveled, or white, yeah, two white brothers that had traveled seven hours to tour college had a Native American call the police on them that kicked them off the tour and, and stopped them from seeing the university. Wow. He paid for his Mentos. This is Jose Ariola in Southern California. He paid for his Mentos, then an officer pulled a gun on him, on this Latino man. If a Latino officer, let's do it again, if a black officer pulls a gun on a white man after buying his Mentos, are we, are we okay with that? 
Ouster of Disruptive Book Club. Everybody remember this one? From Napa Train prompts racial bias charge. This black woman book club, they were on the Napa Wine Valley tour for their book club. They were kicked off the train for being too loud. The group of 11 women, 10 of them black and one white, filed a lawsuit when the group was escorted off the train for laughing and talking too loudly, then met by police officers at the station where they disembarked. What if seven white women were kicked off a train for being too loud on a wine train? <laughs> a woman said she saw burglars. They were just white Airbnb guests. Really? This is actually Bob Marley's granddaughter, and she's placing a lawsuit. Leaving an Airbnb. <laughs> Cops are called on you. Everyone knows this one. Starbucks CEO apologizes after the arrest of two white men who were sitting in a Starbucks for two minutes waiting for someone for a meeting. How does it feel when you flip it in a different way? If you, under, if you want to ask the question, maybe those white men were causing problems. Maybe they were sitting there quietly looking like they were going to rob the place. Maybe those white men look like terrorists. What does that look like? All of those instances I showed you, except for the wine train, those all happened in a one month period. So imagine being a person of color in America watching these news stories just come around one by one by one, plus dealing with whatever you're dealing with in your regular life and the BS that you're dealing with walking around also. What does that feel like? So here's some helpful tips for when people of color make you nervous, okay? Think of why you are there and consider they are there for the same reason. They're people just like you, okay? Say hello, start a conversation. Chances are they are more afraid of you than you are of them. Because if you call the cops, the cops will believe you. If I call the cops, they're gonna shoot me. Realize that you have a right to your feelings, but a right to exclude others from public places if you're still uncomfortable, you can leave. Don't assume they're a threat because they're different from you. And please, don't call the police and imply that they are dangerous because you're putting their life at risk when you do. And now you see the number of videos that are coming out of white people calling the cops on black people and people of color in public spaces. And sometimes not good things happen. And if you think it only happens to these people on social media and on TV and other places and not to people you know, it's happening to people you know. Black professor pulled over and harassed by Georgia Tech Police Department, then called an additional cop car to in interrogate me for a tiny light out by my license plate. I drive a BMW. That car tells me everything that's wrong with it. There was, a, so, there was nothing on the dashboard that told me things was wrong. I'm sitting at a red light, sitting still at a red light. A Georgia Tech police officer pulls up behind me and then puts his sirens on. I've got to turn into this parking lot. And another cruiser comes up. It's 11 o'clock at night. I'm in a blazer. I'm dressed up. I had just left the Dean of Science's Christmas party. My, tag, my BMW has Morehouse plates on it. Morehouse is an all-black male school. You expect to see a black man driving a car with more house plates on it. And they held me up for 30 minutes. And then lady said, you have this one little light out. Oh, thank you. Professional black woman with 25 years experience working at Georgia Tech with high praise and evaluations for 25 years was denied a promotion because, and this was written, she comes off abrasive and lacks poise. Whew! As determined by an all-white male panel. Whew! This is the most poised black woman I know. She came to Georgia Tech from banking, okay? They don't play games in banking. Two black female graduate students were verbally assaulted with the N-word as they walked across campus. These were my two graduate students. And I was out of town when this happened. They called me, quite upset, as you can imagine. And we had to discuss a plan of action. And this is in the springtime. And then I'm not sure how many of you know about Scout Schultz, who was... Um, a, non a gender non-conforming individual that, a white gender non-conforming individual that the Georgia Tech police shot and thought that he had a gun or that thought that they had a gun. It happens to people you know. These are not myths and made up things. And I saw this and I loved it. Um, this is a professor at Yale, and he's a black professor, that feeling at the end of a grueling day when every black faculty member has been working overtime to support black students dealing with racism, and you run into some white colleagues after work and they seem unbothered and you realize, Shit, they spent their day writing. I'm dealing with all of these other things. And guess what? I ha they held me to the same expectations. So this is why we should talk about the power of privilege, right? 
And privilege, there was a talk given by Naomi Kessler from the University of Wisconsin when she won the diversity award, I think it was maybe three years ago. And I loved her talk, where she talked about privilege. Privilege is on multiple axes, not just race and gender like we think about. So there's gender privilege and race, that's what we think of. There's heterosexual privilege, height privilege. I'm tall. I make fun of all the short grad students in my lab, and I put things on top shelves that I don't want them to get at, because they have to work for it, okay? Citizenship privilege. Particularly in today's America, it's easy to be a U.S. citizen, or it's easier to be a U.S. citizen than not. And the anxiety level is different for non-citizens, particularly in today's America. Language. English is my first language. Everyone in America should speak English, some might say, right? They don't have to, but English for me is a first language privilege, and I don't have an accent when I talk it. Well, I developed a bit of a southern accent, my northern friends have said. Physical ability, education, class, socioeconomic, Christian privilege. All of these things are the different axes of privilege that people should think about. So we all have some type of privilege. It's not just, well, I'm not a white male, I have no privilege. It's not true. And that's where it's important to recognizing intersectionality, because where those privileges axes can oversex, so do our identities. So let's talk about privilege, because these people want to get, they get in a tizzy when they think about it. So privilege simply means that under the exact same set of circumstances you're in, Life would be harder without your privilege. So, examples. Being poor is hard. Everyone can agree to that, yes? Being poor with a disability is harder. Being a woman is hard. Being a trans woman is harder. These intersections. Being a white woman is hard. Being a woman of color is harder. Being a black man is hard. Being a black gay man is harder at least as society is constructed today. So let's talk a little bit more. So privilege is the other side of oppression. It's definitely easier to notice the oppression you personally experience than the privileges you experience, because we all see the bad things happening, right? So since being mistreated is likely to leave a much bigger impression on us than when we're treated fairly, because we expect that, so we just shake that off, right? But notice when we're mistreated. But privilege and oppression affect each other, but they do not negate each other. So mostly, or often, people believe they can't experience privilege because they also experience oppression. But this is the big reason why they've been able to separate poor whites and blacks. They can have similar issues, right? But there is a different privilege for the poor whites compared to poor blacks. Privilege describes what everyone should experience. We don't use the term privilege because we don't think everyone deserves this treatment. We call it privilege because we acknowledge that everyone experiences it. Think about those different axes. Again, I'm a tall black man. Tall is a privilege. You look at people's, uh, I think 75% uh, of CEOs are above a certain height, right? There's a privilege to being tall. And here's the real kicker, and this is what I want everybody to get. Privilege doesn't mean you didn't work hard. And this is where people want to fight. I work hard, yes. Privilege doesn't mean that you didn't work hard. You can be privileged and still have a difficult life. Privilege doesn't mean that your life is easy, but rather that it's easier than others in certain aspects. Doesn't mean you didn't work hard. Anybody getting a PhD works hard for it, right? A black, disabled, gay little person, they had to work a lot harder for that, especially if they were doing it in, I won't even say. <laughs> and what's important here that I like to also say, while my lived experience may be up for discussion, it is never up for debate. So when I tell you what I'm experiencing and there are things that I, where I lack privilege and I'm being treated differently, I can discuss it with you because I'm, I'm, I'm willing to engage in a conversation. But don't tell me I'm wrong. And that's why when I started this, I'm talking from my lived experience. I will not presume to tell you that you are not experiencing things that you say that you're experiencing, right? Because this is your experience and I will believe you. And where we want to get down to privilege is also the importance of being a good ally. When you recognize your privilege, it allows you to be a good ally to others that are without that privilege. So I think about allyship is using your privilege for good, because a good ally steps aside and lets the person without privilege have space. And I can't think of a better example of this than the Parkland High School students. They recognize that they are from a white, rich area, and that is why when the shooting happened at their school, they had a certain platform, the news media. People were all over them, right? And then what did they do? They stepped aside to let other victims of school violence have the stage. Because in America, when everybody wants to talk about shooting and guns and gun control, what city do they always say, well, it doesn't work in this city? What city? Chicago. Chicago. They stepped aside and let students in Chicago have space. And why this is important is people want to say the people of Chicago aren't, they're not really trying to fight gun violence, they're not doing this. 
Well, let's look at people in Chicago. May 2017, look at these little boo-boos. These little students, they were protesting because there was, gun, there was lots of guns where this school didn't even take outdoor recess. So what was their protest? They played outside for 30 minutes and had a march. So just by playing outside was their protest. And this didn't get covered nationally. December 2016, the year before, look at the number of people in Chicago protesting gun violence when they said people in Chicago don't care about the guns. July 2015, people in Chicago, another major protest, put the guns down, let our kids grow up. People in Chicago, they don't care about the guns. July 2014, another major gun rally and gun rights rally in Chicago. 2013, I love this, and this also breaks my heart, protect children, not guns. In Chicago, major rallies. And so whenever somebody says that these things are not happening, a good ally makes space and brings them to the stage. And so I want to just end with this. Puerto Rican lives matter. There's some things that have been happening in the news today while I've been making my visit that are just unbelievable. Their lives do matter. And let's think, we're almost a year since Hurricane Maria. 3,000 people dead. Houston lives matter. Hurricane Harvey, they've recovered, but this is what North Carolina and South Carolina may look like in the next three or four days. Their lives also matter. <clears throat> Gay lives matter. Black lives matter. This doesn't have to be controversial. If Houstonian lives matter, black lives matter. They're all people. Black gay lives matter. Intersectionality. There's no reason to separate one from the other. Jewish lives matter. As anti-Semitism is on the rise and neo-Nazis are making their voice known in America, let's remember their lives matter. Native American lives matter, and they don't have a platform in many other spaces. Mexican lives matter. These poor children, separated from their parents. Those lives matter. Those are human beings. Trans Mexican lives matter. Again, intersections are very real, and those also need to be included. And again, as an engineer, you all took set theory or discrete math or whatever that class was called, or logic if you were a philosophy major. And so for someone to say all lives matter has to be true, each of those individual ones that I just stated has to be true for the whole to be true. So for all lives matter to be true, black lives matter has to be true, gay lives matter has to be true, Jewish lives matter has to be true. So the debate is settled, okay? <laughs> so next time someone wants to argue, they say, well, listen, you're right, all lives do matter, and for that to be true, black lives matter has to be true, so thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> and I love my society, BMES. We have 50% women at the undergrad and graduate <coughs> level. At our annual meeting, we have a women's luncheon. We have a celebration of minorities luncheon. And over the last three years, we've had an LGBT dessert social. We are being inclusive. Bring your whole self to the conference. And we will celebrate your whole self here at this conference. And bring your good science, too, because we do really want that as well. Um, and I'd like to just end with this every person's bill of rights. Because if we could all just recognize that each person is a human being, we could live a better existence. Every person has the right to be treated with respect, period the right to have and express your own feelings and opinions. We're all human beings, and we also have this person in it. This is important, the right to be listened to and taken seriously. If I make a statement that I'm serious about, please take me seriously. Again, I will not question your lived experience, please do not question mine. The right to set your own priorities, it's very important. And the right to say no without feeling guilty. If I set my priority and I've weighed the benefits and consequences, there's no guilt. I'm making a decision for self. The right to get what you pay for, I mean, that's obvious. And the right to make mistakes. Oftentimes, people who are marginalized or underrepresented groups feel like if I make a mistake, they'll never let another one like me in here. We all have the right to make mistakes. It doesn't affect the whole group. It affects me, and I will learn from that mistake, and you won't see it again. But we all do have that right because we all make mistakes. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Love my lab group. I don't know why I have fun in here, I just do. Um, but this is how you can contact me, and again, thank you for listening.